Ta ta ta. Uh, I see some people in the chat are enjoying my my tie today. Yeah, I wanted to stay formal because we have such a a respectable guest on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I needed to bring the A game today. She told me she, so. You know, I could have wear something more formal, whatever. <laughs> Maybe be. Something yeah, yeah, yeah. In my head, <laughs> like a hat. <laughs> yeah, to make it a bit more formal. Um, all right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Like I mentioned before, one is that we have a Slack community, and if you're not in that already, please go ahead and get in it. I think Chris will put the link to it in the chat, or I can put that actually right now. If you're wondering where it is and how to get there, let me just put that in the chat so you can join our Slack community where we've got lots of the past guests and the present guests in the Slack community and they're there to, they can, you know, they're a lot of knowledge is being shared in that space. So you can always reach out to them if you have any problems with any kind of questions you know, it's just a, sp a place there where we can share stuff about what's going on with ML ops. We tend to share like the latest news and all that. So feel free to jump in it. The link is in the chat now. Um, the next thing up, let me stop sharing this screen and I'll share a better screen because we are joined by our friend from Argentina, Carlos de la Torre, or AKA, Carl of the Tower, aka, <laughs> um, aka Letox, uh, yeah, or Pi Letox, if you want to call him that, aka the professor, aka, let me see what else he's called, Carl the construction worker, aka the architect. <laughs> there you go, for a little matrix <laughs> reference for you all, um, aka C Note. So thanks to have you on. Okay, and thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. It's great yeah, to be here. That's a lot of nicknames you got there. And I, I guess only a man of your stature can have so many nicknames like that. Now, <laughs> now I'm going to share another screen with you guys because before we get started, I got to let you know, I sold out. I sold out and... There you go. There you go. mate. <laughs> So, Carlos, being from Argentina, I asked him, hey, are you going to be drinking yerba mate when we have this meetup? And he said, definitely. Yeah. He is it's a big on, it's on the way. <laughs> so, on we, the got, way. we got Amanda Yerba Mate to sponsor this meetup. <laughs> and they just wanted to say that it gives you more energy than Colombian cocaine. And apparently, that's, uh, that's okay to say. And it's zesty, refreshing flavors fit for kings and queens so i'm gonna go ahead and grab mine that they didn't give me the special thing because apparently that didn't make it yet no, you need to throw. Up. no i'm just gonna so go ahead and grab your favorite beverage because we're gonna have a, a bit of a story time here with carlos yeah, my mat is on the way Ooh, so, you might need a little sugar with it yeah it's it's a little bitter <laughs> it's an acquired taste so it's an acquired taste, yes, of course. That's how it goes with Mate. <laughs> all right. Now that we've gotten through all those jokes, let's get into it. I usually start by asking people how they got into tech, but I want to start with you, Carlos, <laughs> by asking you, why haven't you accepted my LinkedIn request? I've been having a pending LinkedIn request for the last like two months oh, really so, yeah so LinkedIn's not the best place to reach out to this guy if you do want to reach out to him afterwards i would <laughs> recommend reaching out to him on the slack community shame man i, I completely lost it you know I, I actually you know like i was like um uh, replying to your posts and you know sharing and stuff like that and i was completely sure that uh, you know it was your friend on linkedin it's actually my main my main social a network these days you know, ah. since I've been doing some recruiting and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So <laughs> mm, that doesn't make me feel good about things. I guess I, I'm, I'm just, too important I for this, you know? 
Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. You're too important for this. You know. I need to send you with my manager. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So now let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about tech a little bit because I'm sure that's what everybody came for. How did you get into tech? How did I? Okay. Um, you know, when I was finishing high school, I thought I was going to be something like an engineer or doing some research in materials and physics and stuff. So I went to South Africa for a cultural exchange for a year. And, you know, those things tend to, you know, change your point of view. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always liked computers, but I never thought about them like for real, like working on computers. So, yeah, after, after that long trip, I said, you know, computers looks all right. And here in my city, actually in Cordoba, we have a big university and in the mathematics school, they've got, a, there's a, you know, a degree in computer sciences. So I just, you know, I said, this sounds good. You know, it's, it's uh, more, it aims to, you know, research and so lots of theory. So I didn't know what it was about really, but I like the university. I like the people there. So I started working with, you know, I have never before written a, a line of code in my life. So I started university computer sciences and I fell in love like every day I was, mm. you know, every day I was sure this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do actually, you know, science and academia, but I started working and it was more, much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to France, you know, to do my final work doing, you know, satellite images processing in, in a research group in France, which was great. And then I came here, started working in the International Space Agency, oh, wow. uh, the processing uh, satellite images and then doing, you know, great stuff there. So that's why I started in tech, you know, university, and then you start working and you meet great people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's so cool. Now, tell us just a little bit about what you're doing right now. What is your current position? Well, besides... Besides a word from our sponsor, Amanda <laughs> Yaramante. You need the straw, you know, because you, you straw, pour. Otherwise. Yeah, you have to pour. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't spill it on the computer. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> don't worry. The okay. sponsorship will pay for that if you broke your computer. It's all good. Okay, so right now I'm working in Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is it's a, it's a, it's the biggest technology company in Latin America. Okay, it's a... It's well known as an e-commerce. It's a leading e-commerce uh, site in, in, in like 17 or 18 countries in Latin America. And we also have a fintech in there. So we have our payments and electronic wallet uh, solutions. And, and um, we have all the logistics for delivering packages in Argentina, Brazil, or Mexico. So Mercado Libre is huge. It's been 20 years on the market. And we are around, you know, 10,000 employees and 4,000 people in IT. So I was working for this uh, machine learning uh, solutions uh, software factory thing uh, with some friends from, from college, okay? And we, we were doing machine learning based solutions for, for several uh, customers and, and, and Mercado Libre became one of our customers and they started uh, working for us and after four years uh, machinalis was acquired okay by then we were we were like uh, around 60 or 70 people working there so in machinalis i started as a developer and technical leader mostly and i uh, by the end i was a engineering director of a small company you know of, of 60 people so i was working mostly with the, with the project managers and but mostly with technical leaders we had the between five to 10 different projects in parallel. Some of them doing NLP and other ones, maybe computer vision and other ones was more traditional machine learning. And so we were having all these different solutions in parallel and I would work to you know, leverage the, the, you know, whatever technical skills and doing a lot of, of, of the technical contact with clients and, and possible customers and stuff like that. And uh, so I was working there with the CTO of the company, okay? It was more into the strategic and uh, part of, of, the, of the team. And I was more with the technical leaders and leading all the technical leaders. So when we were acquired by Mercado Libre, um, we became a, a, an, an, a cross area, machine learning cross area for the company. So we are providing machine learning services and infrastructure for all the teams in the company that need to apply machine learning, okay? There was a lot of machine learning being done here, but uh, 
you know, different teams doing different stuff with different technologies. It's a big company. So some teams were like buying things like Amazon SageMaker or IBM Watson. Some other teams were just, you know, building their own pipelines with, with Python stuff. Other teams were, you know, buying uh, other stuff. And, and there's a big platform as a service thing there for deploying microservices, which was not prepared to do machine learning. You know, we, we didn't have like specific uh, infrastructure in terms of you know, CPU and memory for machine learning. Data sources are really all around. You know, we have a data lake, but we also have a lot of APIs. We have a, a lot of databases. So it's really data is, is, is spread in different ways and it's not always easy to access the different data sources. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, so let's just back that up real fast. Basically, <laughs> you guys, 20 years ago, you were like the eBay for South America or still yes. are. And we are. You became, we are the Amazon for Latin America now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So for Latin America, you guys became like the go-to and you've branched out into payments. You've branched out into other, other, um, what are the yeah, other so markets? ecosystem of, of, of business units. So the marketplace, the vintage with the wallet, uh, uh, logistics and, and your shipping stuff, packages and stuff like that, all the logistics. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, um, marketing and, and advertising and yep. other smaller business units. And then when your company got bought or the company that you were working for before Mercado Libre, when you guys <laughs> got bought, you were brought in to standardize this whole machine learning process because it was a bit all over the place? Actually, actually we, were, we were already, we had already several teams working in different uh, individual solutions. So let's say the recommendations for, for the main page or you know, estimate how long it's gonna package, it's gonna to take to arrive to the customer, or moderations, or, or, or fraud detection. So we had several teams that they continue working as individual teams solving an individual problem, okay? So that we kept doing, you know, but now from, from inside of the company. Uh, and the, te the technolo technological core of the startup became this area cross, okay? So it was you know, formerly the CTO and myself, uh, started working with the, the infrastructure team, all the DevOps and the cloud and platform area in Mercado Libre, and, and we started working with them and with the BI team, which is also cross. And we said, let's build uh, an infrastructure, machine learning infrastructure for all the company. So it's cloud and platform, all the infrastructure guys, BI and us, that started working on this project. And so, so now we're growing. Now we, we, are, we are 15 people now, after a year and a half. Nice. In my area. And the goal here for the next 45 minutes is to dive in as deep as possible to that platform without getting you fired. Without getting me fired, but lucky for us, <laughs> there's a lot of that I can, there's a lot that I can say about it. It's really. Yeah, that's here. very cool that they're open about it and you, you mm -hmm. share and help others learn because mm -hmm. right now, what I'd love to know is your current take on the whole machine learning scene and how you feel it is. Okay, we have a, like in, the, in, our, in, in our area, we have a vision and we want to make Mercado Libre the, the best place to work on machine learning in Latin America. We want professionals in Latin America, uh, you know, deciding to work with us if they want to do machine learning, real machine learning in production. Okay, so that means a lot of, you know, you have to do a lot of things. So this is, this is one of the things we need to do. You know, we have to go out, we have to talk to people, we have to show what we're doing. So we do a lot of, you know, a lot of community work. Python community is great around the globe. I mean, Latin America is great. So it's a, it's a, it's a great starting point. You know, we, we went to PyCon Argentina, PyCon Colombia, SciPy, PyData. You know, you go there, you share, you know, you talk to people and, and you know, we have to share what we are doing. We cannot be lying about this. So then there's this dimension. We have to start doing the, the best machine learning in Latin America. So we're doing, a, we're doing a lot and in my, from my perspective and my job is to, you know, uh, support these things. I'm building technology, I'm, I'm building infrastructure and machine learning operations is not, you know, my team could, name could be uh, MLOps at Mercado <laughs> is... Hence the nickname, the architect. <laughs> <laughs> I think so... I'm going to name it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you feel like MLOps is right now as a whole, what you see around when you go and give these talks? It's definitely, you know, it's, it's, uh, we are building it, we, all of us. 
you know it's uh all the machine learning hype and, and you know machine learning and artificial intelligence and everything there's a lot of, of hype there but but now there's a lot of things that can be done in terms of, of solutions so i think the the machine learning people they, they really have got a lot of tools and they're starting to to consolidate their their frameworks so like this dual track scrums where you have your your you know engineering scrum and then you have all the data scientists working with the engineers. I think that's already working all right. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's um, natural and or organic evolution that ML opts as the next step, because uh, you know, deploying machine learning is like deploying software, which is highly complex and with, with extra dimensions of, of complexity. So just, just you know, not long ago, I was reading this post from uh, Martin Fowler about uh, continuous delivery for, you know, for machine learning. And I think it's a great synthesis of, we have all these tools. Some of them are attacking you know, specific things. And some of them like, you know, maybe SageMaker or Google AI that are trying to, you know, just grab the whole thing. And there are lots of them that are growing and appearing every day. And I think that's normal because we don't have standards yet. There is no like the way to do things. We only know which are the problems there. But there's not like standard solutions, and I, I, I don't even know if it's going to be something like okay, this is going to be like de facto solution in the industry for for this problem. So it's actually great because there's a lot of understanding and knowledge of the problem because DevOps is not new and machine learning is already there being used. So we have a lot of opportunities to build stuff to help in a lot of dimensions. So is it explainability? Is it you know sharing? Is it and a versioning is it deploying is it monitoring so everything is new everything is great we have uh, highly mature engineers all around the globe mm. uh, because devops can work now in, in machine learning operations and you know c and, and developers so before we jump and dive into that a bit more can you give us a bit of background about the machine learning path at mercado libre and how far, how long ago did they start down this path and how did it come about? Okay, in, in my experience, we've been working with them for, for five years. So let's say five years ago, they started buying us, buying services from us as a startup providing and Machinari was already uh, well known in Latin America and mostly in Argentina as the company doing uh, data science or machine learning. And, and Mercado Libre already had a couple of teams doing some machine learning, but you know, mostly for fraud detection uh, and then for the recommendations systems. So I'd say between 10 to seven years ago, they started doing, applying machine learning to, to solve uh, production problems. Uh, when, when we started working with them, each team had a, a different approach. So some of them were trying to buy IBM Watson some years ago, as soon as it started, you know. And they were really just doing all ad hoc stuff on the cloud, on, um, building their own pipelines and trying to, to solve their own little problems. But it was really very specific solutions to, to separate problems, okay? And after we started working with them, we could see that they were not you know, it was different, separate solutions, separate efforts, okay? And we were a company with, uh, with already a lot of experience and doing a lot of machine learning for a long time. So you start to you know, have your processes and you don't reinvent the wheel. And we, have our, we had our own little products to, uh, you know, wrap up models in a REST API, for example. So we could see there was a lot of our work. We could, you know, expand within the organization. So uh, we started working with them maybe five years ago. Uh, and they started taking some things from us uh, in this relationship. And now for the last two years, we started building this platform that now it's, it's a really easy machine in America to start experimenting, accessing data and getting infrastructure. Yeah. So talk to us a bit about Fury. What is Fury and who came up with that name? Because that's a great name for it. A yeah, it's a great name. <laughs> <laughs> so Fury, first it's called Fury because... Okay, you know, we are, okay, lots of nerdy guys and Avengers stuff and, you know, Nick Fury is such a badass, you know. And then the guy who was leading this team, he, he had a, you know, patch on his eye. 
So, <laughs> yeah, nobody wanted to call him Fury. <laughs> but then, you know, they got the chance to name something Fury <laughs> that he was leading. <laughs> so, yeah, the name is just, you know, a product name, which is great. And uh, it, it's, uh, by definition, it's a platform as a service. Developers in Mercado Libre, you go to the Fury interface. It's basically uh, a framework to develop and deploy microservices. microservices. So, basically, when you start an, an app there, you get a repository with, with uh, some standard interfaces, like it's gonna be doc dockerized, your app's gonna be dockerized. So you write your repository, we have all a uh, continuous integration, automatic process there that then you can, you know, create infrastructure. You, you're abstracted from, from the infrastructure. The platform is uh, cloud independent. We're working with different cloud providers. So for the developers is uh, transparent. We, you don't really know where your application is being deployed. Uh, it scales automatically, provides monitoring and, and you know logs and metrics. So it's really to we don't have DevOps in our teams. Okay, we have this Fury platform and, and the, the badass DevOps are like building the platform and, and you know maintaining this. And developers are, are it's really abstracting them from a lot of things. And it's this allowed Mercado Libre to grow, you know, from like for 400 or three year 400 developers to to about 3000 in, in maybe six seven years wow okay it, it, it it's got uh america is 20 years old so they started and america Libre had the biggest cloud one of the biggest clouds in the world before the cloud was actually a thing you know but then when when you know when that asserts this and they, when the cloud started america Libre had a lot of infrastructure so they had to decide are we going to keep this we're going to move so they decided to move to the cloud. So, you know, through the years, you have to start, you know, moving and migrating all your stuff and, and then, you know, close all these data centers. And then it was this thing where you had, you know, access to the cloud, like you have your virtual machine in, and do whatever. And then that's impossible to maintain. And, you know, every, you know, team was choosing a different stack, a different technology, a different database, a different, mm -hmm. you know, queue. So they started creating these Fury, saying, okay, you know, let, let's build our own services. Let's, let's abstract the, the, you know, the services and the infrastructure. So that's Fury. You know? It's for web apps. So then what, is, uh, what exactly is this Fury data apps that comes in on the machine yeah, learning cool. level? Yeah, it's like a, an extension, an in-house built extension to Fury to do data science and machine learning. And okay, so now... So a bit of an for overview example. of how that, yes. that looks. Yes, yes. Um, first, we, we have it, it's working. It's been working for a year and a half. So we, actually, we started to you know bring users in very quickly with a very simple pipeline, and that is now maybe I wouldn't say technical depth, but it's a great drawback. Our pipeline is you have an ETL task, so you have a place where you can do data processing. So it's with a few clicks, you can, you have a, a machine that has got access to the data sources, which was difficult for the, for the teams to get. So now you really are in an environment, secure network environment with permissions to access all the data sources and, and, and the instances with enough, you know, power to do stuff because the, again, microservices, you have these certain flavors that you're using for microservices, but then you need a lot of GPU, uh, CPU or a lot of, of memory to process big data sets. So we gave them this. Then you click, you say, I want an ETL machine, and then you have your ETL process running there. Then similar to that, we had a, a, a training step, a machine where you are supposed to train your model. So then we started giving a versioning. So you version your ETL processes, then you version your training processes related to an ETL process. We store your data. Uh, the training machines, then you have GPUs and you have a specific uh, infrastructure for tra model training process. And then the output of the training is a model. And you can work with basically whatever technology, as long as it's Python. <laughs> like uh, Henry Ford used to say, you can choose whatever color as long as it is black. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so you can choose whatever technology to do your data science as long as it is Python. <laughs> okay. But, okay, it's, it's a, as always, it's a trade-off. I think it's a, it's a good trade-off. You know, we are not 
saying you're not only TensorFlow or it's only scikit left. No, it's whatever as long as you can do it in Python. And then we have a, we, we automated the, the creating a REST API from your model. So that a scientist can quickly get a model and from there, just by configuration, they can deploy infrastructure that will automatically scale uh, with your model serving as, as a REST API. Okay. So all these services, I want infrastructure with access to the data. I want a place where to train models and I want an easy way to deploy a model. Uh, that and then you have uh, Jupyter Labs as a service. So you click and you say, I want a, a Jupyter Lab instance and you get there a Jupyter Lab instance. Um, so this is today mostly of what Curator Apps uh, provides. Okay. So accessing the data was you know, it is a great problem in machine learning. So we are somehow uh, attacking that. There are, as I said before, data is all over. It's all around. Yeah. So we have, you know, some other teams working on a data lake. So some da some curated data is already in place there and they have infrastructure like Hive and Presto to, you know, query and process that data. So we didn't have to solve it. So from, from your lab or from your ETL, you would just, you know, uh, trigger a, a query on Hive and it's going to process in some other infrastructure. And then some teams are now working on, for example, the Spark cluster that have as access to the data. So we're not solving it ourselves as a core team of, the, of FDA, you know, Fury Data Apps. But yeah. But then does that yeah. plug into the Fury Data Apps? Yeah, we, we, want, to, we want to enable what we call um, external innovation. So if the BI team is doing this great, uh, you know, Spark cluster and they've got the resources to actually, you know, maintain it, like they, can, they have like the budget for this infrastructure and they can keep it alive and they can provide it as a service. We want to, we want to be able to use it from FDA. So you know, there is another team, for example, we have a team working on our, a feature catalog right, in, the, in, the, in, the fraud, in the fraud area. Okay, so they've got really strong representations of, of entities as payments or, or, or customers, okay? Real good machine learning valuable representations and th that they are computing almost real time, okay? So it's a big problem and they're solving it because they need to, so we want to integrate with them, okay? So in that sense, we are building this platform but we're also trying to not do everything because, okay, we all know it's, it's, it's huge. You know? <laughs> Every little problem requires a, a team effort, a budget, right? And so when you're looking at the size of these data sets that the machine learning engineers and the data scientists are training their models on, what kind of sizes are we talking here? Because I imagine it's just got to be gigantic. Yes, it's, it's huge. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to read an example because I was asking this week I was asking this question. So these guys were telling me they've got a, a training data set of 800 gigabytes, for example, for, for one of the models. Okay, it's got, uh, it's got 72 million rows, the, the training data sets. I think, and now, you know, let's not discuss machine learning, but they're using 4,000 features and 72 million rows, and they say maybe they could be using less. Maybe they could, <laughs> okay, but in terms of these, there is teams that are, that are using like 1.5 terabytes uh, training data sets. Okay, of course, then you have sometimes you don't need so much, but this is a, a big example that I could found. You know, they are trying to, yeah. to analyze all the payments in a given time span, uh, all the transactions of the site to detect something around fraud. Uh, that means processing 1.5 terabytes of, of training data sets. Are these training sets, are these replicas of the data or is this real, the actual data? We have, um, okay, there's, there's a lot of different things. Because of regulations and all, because of all, uh, you know, security, GDPR, stuff like that. In Latin America, we don't have GDPR yet. Brazil has got a, a similar initiative. Brazil is, is our, our main market, okay. And Mexico is, is uh, trying to do something like that. So we don't have something as strict as, F, as GDPR, but we, we are, we're trying to take it into account because it's going to happen. So we still have 
in, in terms of, of data security, it is secure in terms of, of you know, networking and, and stuff like that. And, and we do have, and it's very clear what, what is sensitive data and it's not easy to access sensitive data. But uh, from there, once you are in Mercado Libre, you have access to most of the data, uh, real time, uh, fresh data. Okay. Of course, passwords, credit cards, those things are real in, in the vault. But there is a lot of, of data that we could say is actually sensitive that right now we, we are having access, but we're working to actually securize that and you know, all, mm. to apply to, to the strict regulations. The thing is that if you're a data scientist today and you kind of know how to, you, you, you can access some data. Of course, not passwords, not uh, credit cards, not, not that kind of information. And it's, it's all over because, you know, as it's micro microservices, every, each service has got its own databases. So the, the user's a database. We don't have a centralized database. Okay, we have the lake, but the lake is a curation of this data with its one day old. So if you can work with one day old data, then you have, a, you have an access to a curated data lake, mm -hmm. which is great for the machine learning and for data science. But if you need to be there real time, then you have to access these other data sources. They go directly to the APIs and try to get dumps from there and stuff like that. And so how much time is spent on the upkeep of these Fury data apps? How, how big of a team are you running and how much maintenance is needed? Okay, we have, uh, it's three areas that are building this, this product. It's us as machine learning cross, infrastructure, and BI. So we are to cooperative building this. So we have a development team of, let me see, three, four, five. So currently it's, it's uh, about six, uh, about 10 people, okay, full-time working for this. Around six, seven uh, developers plus a technical leader or some, or some, let's say, technical manager, full-time working on the development and maintenance of the service. So we have a 24-7, you know, uh, maintenance service. So we have a you know, intercom chat where users can, you know, load tickets, saying if they, if they have problems. So the same development team has to fix the production issues and, and keep everything working, okay? And at the same time, we have this, our Scrum and our backlog and we keep building. So it's about 10 people and it's, we're planning to make it grow. So it should be about 15 by the end of the year. If anybody's and looking also, for a job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're hiring. <laughs> Actually, right now, I'm trying to build a new team in Colombia. We regularly uh, opened the IT offices in Colombia uh, this year. Uh, so I want to I want to create a, a new team from scratch uh, just to work in, in this uh, in this same project. As I told you, we're open to external innovation. So I could have a team doing something like a new feature for this project without being part of the core team. Okay. And how do you integrate that in? How do you test to make sure that it's okay and everything works all right before you say, okay, <laughs> now this is part of the Fury platform. Okay. We're working on that. We are. Um, it depends on how much you need to actually integrate with, the, let's say, with the infrastructure, because lots of lots of solutions you can do with microservices. So you create your own user interfaces, you have your own services, you access the whole infrastructure as a service, and you can do a lot of that, a lot of things without actually having to to plug your your system into the the infrastructure. But sometimes then you need to plug it down. So that's the core team. We are the ones that we own the accounts in the different cloud providers. We've got the passwords, we've got the network management. So the idea is that as long as you can do outside, you can do, and then we talk about interfaces. And if, you know, as long as it is you know, REST APIs and REST interfaces, are, there's a lot that, that can be done. Now, if you have to go deeper beneath the infrastructure level, then, you have to talk a lot with you know, security, security, again, it's a security team cross Mercalli yeah. and the infrastructure team cross Mercalli because as you said, you know, they will make, the, they need to make sure that you, 
it's if your system is unstable okay it's your responsibility but do not you know <laughs> not mess with the rest of the infrastructure so part of working together means that we're, we're working on that on defining you know uh, how can we integrate our teams how can you accept collaboration from outside uh, maintaining the, the quality of the service so we're, we're working together but any of these innovation projects mm -hmm. if a data scientist wanted to use it they would be able to it's just that it's not integrated into the fury platform yeah, exactly for example let's say um a feature catalog a feature catalog has from from the user perspective is something that okay i just want the feature that represents this user so a feature catalog ends up exposing a rest api it's a service right feature catalog give me the the vector for for user a and you get a vector so that can be in an absolute independent place working by itself. Uh, but see, uh, if from the FDI, from the ETL, or from the training phase, or from the, from, you know, the serving app, the app does actually get the request. If I've got network access to this other you know, feature catalog, that's enough, that's an integration. Just make, have to make sure that we have network access and that we don't have a, a you know, latency, you know, too much of a latency, and, and then if they have authorization or authentication policies, okay, let's, let's see how we can, you know, I can make sure that my app only accesses those features that is allowed to access. So it's really, there's a lot of things that you can do independently. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that seems like the right way to do it. Then you don't have to be tied in and locked in. To the like in, monit we, we're, in my team, we're building another product. It's um, aimed to monitoring, machine learning monitoring service. And uh, we are building all of it independently from this infrastructure, but eventually I need to plug into the API. If you have a model in production, you have an API serving inputs, you know, getting inputs and, and you know, the returning outputs. So as long as I can plug there and I can, you know, just bring all these input and outputs to my infrastructure, I can provide you all the monitoring service. So it doesn't need to be in the same UI UI as, as FDA, it doesn't need to, I can do it all independently. So I need to talk with FDA and I, I need to say, look, I want to plug here. I want to plug efficiently here. Maybe even in, in the traffic layer. So I don't actually, you know, I do nothing with your API. I don't add you one millisecond of extra time. So that's where we have to talk to FDA. And lucky for me, <laughs> I'm in both projects. <laughs> but you know, it, it works. If you have, you know, clear interfaces, integration is great and as you guys were building out this whole platform did you decide to build on top of any open source and what like because i know that maybe kubeflow was before the time that you started building this so would you have built on top of anything differently do you look back and you say all right i want i wish that we can use this now uh, yes, we do. We are using lots of open source things, right? Like, for example, Terraform or, or lots of HashiCorp products for, for managing infrastructure and stuff like that. So all the platform, uh, all the infrastructure is based on, on, on a lot of inf uh, open source stuff. Regarding this machine learning infrastructure, we, we started uh, working on the building blocks that Fury already had. So, for example, Kubeflow. Or, or a solution like that, it's uh, somehow competing with Fury, okay? Uh, so there are lots of products and a lot of startups and a lot of tools right now out there that I can see, and we are constantly looking at them. Mostly, you know, to review, you know, the feature set they provide and to validate that we are tackling the same problems, that, that means that, you know, we're doing that kind of the right thing. But it's very difficult for us to, to leverage already you know built solutions the, the biggest the solutions are the most difficult is for us to you know to acquire them now different you know uh, when they become smaller then maybe so now after after let's say a couple of years building this and, and a couple of years being touched with this world and when you start getting to know all these products and all the things that are coming out if, if i could start from scratch i would definitely start using some other, some of these products that are out there, I, I definitely start using them. 
at least to solve a part of our problem. Because in ML ops, that's the problem. You have actually a lot of things to solve. Is it you know data access? Is it serving models? Is it storing your assets? Is it version? Is it monitoring? So we, we I think in a, maybe in a naive way uh, attack everything. Okay. <laughs> so now we have a, we have a solution that works and it's being used and it's really being used in production. It's highly effective. And it's doing a lot of things. But then if you know when we look at the at the future backlog, we see that it's huge. Really, we have a lot of things to do. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's the point where we are now. And do you think that Fury data apps would ever be opened up to become an open source? It's not possible because, as I'm telling you, it's built on the building blocks of Fury, which is a built-in solution tied to the business logic of Mercado Libre. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's really, we have, it's, it's, it's like it won't make sense outside of Mercado Libre in a lot of ways. Okay, so what's the concept of the team of collaborators? Uh, give me a sec. I don't know if you could hear my my son <laughs> playing and <laughs> hitting something. <laughs> Whatever. That's what so I yeah, understand. but yeah, but I, I definitely think, and we always talk about it. We are we are very, you know, open source is at, at our core. My mm -hmm. team. Uh, and we think that different libraries and different pieces could be open. In fact, there's one of them that's uh, wrapping the model in a REST API automatically. We've been talking about, you know, open sourcing that. But again, we also have experience with open source. And I think open source is it's a to to. I don't know, I don't feel like it's got, yeah, it, it's, it's a, a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword. And if you go open source with something, it's a big responsibility. Mm. Otherwise, it comes back. Because if you, if you, because it's easy to open source stuff, right? You do a lot of noise, you go, like you publish it everywhere, you put it there, and we've done it in the past. But then you, then you have users. If, if you are unlucky, you will have users. <laughs> They will come to you with, with feature requests and with bad, re you know, with bad uh, reports. And uh, you see, so you need to maintain it. it you, ha you have a big responsibility. So if, if you do it from a personal perspective, it's easy. If you do it from a small company, you have to think about it. But if you do it from a big company, I can't just be responsible in name of such a big company. You know? mm. So we, we will definitely do it. Um, you know, we're thinking in contributing to open source, but differently. Not by open sourcing our little tools, but we are, we are trying to do with our upper managers is to start investing in existing open source right. projects. And how you do that, I don't know. We are, we are using in the Jupyter Labs. So why don't I hire somebody to work full time on Jupyter Labs features? Oh. but it's from my company so that's a great way to to contribute to open source okay so we're using our flask okay so why don't we hire somebody to work 100 percent or 80 percent of his time in the, as a flask core developer you know, that's contributing to open source yeah you know? again and that makes a lot of various hiring in case <laughs> anybody is wondering <laughs> in case anybody wants to go down to colombia Yes, <laughs> they're looking for people. In Colombia, it's easy. <laughs> in Argentina, I'm almost done with my team here. I, I, I've hired yeah. already three, four people this, this semester. <laughs> so we talk a lot about automation on here. And some of the past guests have had very strong opinions on automation. And I'm wondering how much of the Fury data apps have you guys decided to make so that you can automate things and how mm -hmm. much have you said hey we don't need this to be you, you don't need to be able to automate this now, automation is a key feature we just released automation uh, a couple of months ago we in this pipeline that i was telling you etl you have to be able to automate the, these steps training we decided you have to be able to automate your training and then we are building now a new feature where you it's, it's a batch processing. It's a 
compute a, a batch of inferences. Once you have your model, and if you know your inputs, then you should be able to, to get a batch of outputs. So you, you can then you know, deploy your plan. So all these tasks, we want to be automated. We are not automating the, the building of the, of the, what we call model program interface. We don't automate the building of the, of the API, and we definitely do not automate the deploying. That's how Mercado Libre is handling infrastructure now, in that sense, because you, there has, it has to be very clear uh, who's got the responsibility for the deploy. Okay, we don't want, right now, because there's a, there's a big business to, to keep alive. So you so can we point can't, your finger at somebody if anything messes up. There, there, is, there has to be a clear responsibility of who's deploying and why. So, so I think I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and mostly in machine learning, because it, and, and mostly in machine learning, because you have to be able to quickly deploy a model. So for us, the, the, building the model ends up being a, a Docker image, okay, with your, with your embedded model there. So building it, the, our models is quick, and deploying the models is quick. Okay? It's all there, it's just point and click, and it works. And all the scaling goes automatically. But now, Deciding if a model is, is appropriate to deploy is not an easy task. We know it's not. All, we all know. You can't, you can't just work with, off, with your offline metrics. Okay, so deploying um, strategies for machine learning is another place where, you know, we still have a lot of things to do as ML You know, blue, green, canaries, A-B testing of models, all of that should be featured in our platform. And at least for us, it's, it's uh, risky to automate this deploy. Of course, I want to give you as close as possible that if you decide, okay, this is the model I want to deploy, there should be a click. Should be real easy. But I'm not yet wanting to, to automate it. And how, did, how do you build this metric tracking? What did you build that on top of? And can you walk us through that? Mm -hmm. We don't have yet nothing about, around metrics because we think it's a big it's a big feature. We have a lot of ideas, a lot of things we want to do. We didn't build uh, nothing yet. Something that is in our backlog and hopefully will be attacking by the end of this year is uh, what we call experimentation or online experimentation of models. Basically, an A/B testing of models. Uh -huh. The thing is, A/B testing is is too too related to UI, to UI things in, in the web world, but, uh, but you know, A-B testing of models. I, I want to give my teams the ability to, to um, deploy several versions of the same model and, and you know, give traffic to all of them. And then, but again, as we have many teams, um, many teams working with different technologies and with different kinds of models, we are not, you, you should standardize some things for that to work, some formats, you know, What's, what's the signature of your API? What's the signature of your input? We are not doing nothing with that. It's very, very, very complex to, you know, analyze data if I don't know the signature. So we have, a, we have some, you know, a long way to go there. We are thinking two things. One is we implement the feature and we propose a um, interface. So look, if your model respects this interface, then I will give you this feature. Okay, that's one possibility. And the other possibility is to more complex provide maybe hooks or, 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 or libraries where they can, look, I don't understand your signature, I don't understand your, your interface, but you send me this information and you can use the feature. So a different approaches. So again, every team, you know, they define their interfaces. Is it JSON? Is it a number? Is it a list? Is it whatever, you know, your model can actually output whatever. That's why for me, it's difficult to anal analyze it. Yeah. But yeah, I, think, I, I hope I'll be doing something by the end of the year with that. Yeah, that's awesome. And yes. it, it, it makes sense. I see a question from Gonzalo in the chat and he's asking, uh, um, not sure if we addressed this yet, but uh, does Mercado Libre store the features? And I think you said, yeah, you have a feature catalog. Right, you, so you have a feature store of some kind. Yeah, that's, that's a solution of one of the teams and they uh -huh. are building a feature store. 
And so you guys, you built that in-house. You didn't build it on top of any open source. <laughs> I don't know the implementation details of that system. It's a complex thing because this team, they are working with a lot of Google Cloud Platform infrastructure. So I know they are using services of GCP, okay? Um, uh, but I know they are building their, their own APIs, their own logic, their own things, uh, because the team has got very tight restrictions on time. They need to be able to have these features in a very, Time span, short time span. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know what open source tools they're leveraging in there. I'm not in the details. And right now, you're working more primarily with the uh, the monitoring solution. Is that what you, yes. you mentioned before? And One so of my teams are working. Yeah. Can you break down how you're going about that? Are you building on yeah. top of like Prometheus and Grafana, or are you using a, a third party solution? How does that look? Our MVP is currently working. We built it, all of it, uh, with Fury's infrastructure. So, first of all, we have a, a connector, is our, um, an API for collecting the data, collecting your model inputs and outputs. So, if you have your own custom model, you can use my library and it will send your records, your inputs and outputs to my infrastructure. Or if you are using FDA and you are using the already integrated solution, it's just a configuration. You enable the monitoring and, and then I start receiving. So all the infrastructure to receive all these records and store it in, in S3, okay? Right now, I, I, I use the, I'm using services of Mercado Libre, microservices, and, and uh, we have a, a message queue, and I have databases, and I have uh, storage provided by Mercado. But with, this, with the microservices of Mercado Libre. But it, this is not, it, it will not scale, okay? So my beta users actually, we, I can support up to, let's say, uh, between 10 and 20K requests per minute, 20,000 requests per minute, okay? So it depends, of course it depends on the context, but for us, those are small models, okay? Because I want to attack what for me are the big fish, and it's, for example, the model that predicts uh, how long it's gonna take a package to get to your house. So as soon as you navigate to the home, to, to a page view, to an item view, you can see a little estimate there saying, you know, it's gonna you know, go to your house. So that's receiving a lot of traffic because every item is, somebody's looking at. And that API is handling like average 2000 uh, records per minute. And, and they've got spikes of almost a million records per minute. So that's, that's the scale I want to handle. And I cannot do it with microservices. In, uh, so I need to go to the, to the infrastructure. I will need to use either Kinesis from, from Amazon or, or whatever Google provides and stuff like that. So, so now my team is working on that. We already have an MVP that's working, but we want to go to the big fish. So they, are gonna, they, are, they started working with the infrastructure team to see how can we access, because as I'm telling you, the users, developers of Mercado Libre are abstracted from the cloud. So now I, I'm going beneath the infrastructure and I uh, need access to specific cloud services. Uh -huh. so then that's only to, re to store all inputs and outputs. The current MVP, works in the following way. If you have a model, we, we, we talk and we see what's, what, what do you want to monitor? What are the checks that we want to do? What are the conditions? What are the, the assumptions? Typically, um, it's going to be about, you know, these values can never exist, or this is the, the distribution of the inputs that I'm expecting, or this is the distribution of the outputs that I'm expecting. So those uh, statistical checks typically, but then also maybe it's business checks. No, I mean, this value could never occur, or this relationship between this input and this output is impossible. Or if I have a, a sequence of 2000 inputs that are the same, that may be a problem. So we define those checks. We implement specifically those checks for that model. And then we, re we get all the records and every day we run the checks for every model. So right now that's automated. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask in all of these, when you're putting a model together and you're saying, all right, I'm pushing this model out, 
all of these things that you're looking for, is there a, a way that you can say, oh, well, I had a model that was similar to this, so I'm just going to take those checks and put it, apply it to this model. This is, this is something we started this uh, first. As we are in, in beta, beta users, okay, so we, are, we own all the monitors. So we know this. Oh, look, it's the same checks as that other model. But the idea in the future is that actually the users will be able to integrate and not me writing their checks. So I want to do some what we call generic monitors. And then we're talking with the data science team. And for example, if you have a binary classifier case, then if you have a binary classifier case, there is this standard set of checks that should, you should be doing. So I want to implement it as a base class kind of thing. Okay. So I'm thinking in an interface where the users, they know their models, they will, they will be able to inherit from some base class, write their own code about their own monitors, uh, and I should be able to automatically run their code and, and present them with an API to, you know, dashboarding, alarms. Mostly what, what we are doing now is we are running the monitors one a day, once a day. So that means for some uh, models, one day of data is not too much, but for some cases, one day of data, it's several gigabytes. So now that's what I, I have beta users. We are, you know, we are, we are basically testing the interfaces and we can see that until now it's working. So uh -huh. I need to work, I need to scale. I can't process it in just a, a single machine. I will, need, I will need to, I don't know, maybe let us a Dask cluster or Spark cluster or something just to process the data to run your monitors. I need to integrate with the alarms system of the of Mercado Libre. You, know, you want to be alarmed if your if your if your model you know outputs are not as expected. So right now it's what the report. Hello, oh, model own. You know these were your checks. These checks failed. These checks didn't fail and stuff like that. So it's really an, an MVP. That's so cool to hear. Uh, Carlos, we're reaching the top of the hour. Thank you so oh, much. You're right. I could sit here and talk all day, but I want to be respectful of your time. You can see that, you can see that I can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just going to mention that if anyone wants to continue the conversation with you, don't reach out to him on LinkedIn because he doesn't <laughs> respond on there. Go into I'm the on, Slack. I, I'm on the Slack channel. He's on and... the Slack channel. <laughs> yeah. He's more responsive there than he is on LinkedIn. <laughs> this has been so cool, man. Thank you for giving us, you know, un, untucking the covers a little bit, giving us a little peek into what you all are doing down there at Mercado Libre. It's been super insightful. And I'm so thankful that you just came and you offered to do this. So... Um, my pleasure yeah. and I, I love the opportunity you gave me and it would have been great to actually be able to you know to talk to the people that, that's here so i'd love if you know you guys that are just there listening just you know challenge what i said tell me the different you know decisions that you took or, or if you took the same decisions as me please you know also tell me and and I, i'll be glad to talk on slack and then maybe we'll see each other in some conference or something That'd be great. yeah that's that's a great point like being open to being wrong and letting your letting yourself find out what's the best way to do this not just oh this is how we're doing it because this is how we do it but you're it it's very obvious that you're open to finding the best practices and and that's really cool to see i think we are all building this and we have to share and we'll see how, we'll, we'll see and i'm sure i'm sure he yeah. asking why i'm talking english <laughs> I'm sure it, it can, you know, we could be doing better, but that's true for everybody. So yeah. I just want to discuss with everybody. <laughs> so if anybody has a strong opinion about how Carlos could be doing better, let him know in the Slack group. Let Otherwise, a yes. big thank you again. And don't forget, Yerba Mate, thank you to them for <laughs> Amanda Yerba Mate being our sponsors for today's show. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, I'll send them the video so they can, you know. <laughs> yeah, they in. really should sponsor us now after all we've talked about them. And you guys are hiring. So reach yes. out to Carlos if you want to spend a few years in Colombia. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much for the for opportunity. Yeah, we'll Goodbye. see you later. Bye, Carl. Bye. Bye, bye.